uh, Dr. Brodsky is not here today, so she has to just introduce the speaker. Um, we have Dr. Set, uh, Eric Setsky um, from uh, Montefiore, pediatric cardiologist. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Well, I'm actually more out here than I am there. Nice to meet you, um, I've actually been in this area about 18 years now in the Hudson Valley. And um, they asked, you know, what kind of things we talked about. I think last time some of us met, we talked about kind of the athlete, the young athlete, and sudden cardiac death, and, and covered those, some of those things. And I was thinking about what kind of stuff we could talk about today, and I thought I really should focus on what it is that I do, what my strength is, which is really, you know, the bedside, the clinical stuff. There's a, you know, a lot of research and stuff like that, but I didn't think that would be very appropriate for, you know, something that is just such a small curiosity, but not really as practical as how do you you know, evaluate a child, what do we think about, what kind of things are going on in the field right now. So I thought what we would do is just give a kind of a, a background. And we always assume that everybody knows things, but a background to, to get the cardiology. I have a colleague here who knows we come from the same institution originally from Columbia, but there's a lot of history to the field, but it's not a very old field. Um, and kind of maybe just give a more of a sense of a synopsis of what pediatric cardiology is. Um, today, and where it's come from, and kind of where we're going, as we also talk about how do we just do what we do at the bedside. I think a lot of what happens is we focus so much on the technology that we forget that there's still a stethoscope around our necks and the bedside. In fact, the New York Times about five years ago did an article and said the only people who really know how to use stethoscopes or who really do use them still are pediatricians. And everybody else kind of says, it makes it look like, you know, it's a right passage. I have a stethoscope on it. Patients obviously don't know if you're an MD, a PA, a nurse, a tech, or whatever you are, but they're a stethoscope on it. Um, so how do we use that, and, and what do we do with it? And so a little bit that. So that's what we're going to cover today, I think. Hopefully something that's kind of interesting but a little practical as well. Um, in the background, um, the field, again, started with a combination of both surgical and medical that came together. If anybody um, hasn't seen something the Lord made, um, it's I think now available on Netflix or all those kind of things. But it really starts with this, um, the background of Dr. Blaylock and Dr. Tausick, thanks. Um, but, you know, pretty early on, Dr. Gross uh, did something that he would put him in jail today, which is when his chairman left um, for sabbatical, which back then probably meant several months, um, he said, I think I know how to close a PDA. I've done it in pigs. Um, I think I can do it in a human being. Now, you've got to put yourself in 1938. There really wasn't any anesthesia. Antibiotics were so-so. And you're going to make a leap from a pig to an infant. But they did. And when his boss left, he went down to basically the basement with his nurse, numbed up the area with some ice, and, and opened up and ligated a PDA on a baby. Uh, when his boss found out, came back, said, you're fired, and the board came and said, no, you're fired. You didn't have the guts. I don't know if that's the word they use. The guts to do it, he's now in charge. Put yourself in that scenario today. I, don't think not only the hospital you upset, but you'd probably be in court and in jail. So that's how the field started surgically, okay? And, and obviously that was very important. Subsequently, um, if you, again, something the Lord made, an amazing movie of talking about these three people, Dr. Blaylock, Tausig, and Thomas, try to write a scenario where you say, I'm going to do a screenplay. I want a southern surgeon in the deep south in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, a young woman physician and a black carpenter. We're going to put this together and make a story. Probably would never make it on Hollywood. They would probably turn the script down. But that's what happened. These three people got together and worked out cyanotic heart disease. And I think what's very important is to realize that was not only the first operation done on a baby. That was the first heart operation done on a human being. So the field of cardiology and cardiovascular surgery started with pediatric cardiology. And I find that's pretty impressive. And bring a lot of tissues when you watch the movie. It's pretty amazing, all right? Um, subsequently, in the 1940s, again, put yourself into the context of what's happening today. And here this is 1944. We're in the middle of World War II. And these people are working out things. So Dr. Crawford uh, worked on the first co 
Um, and I think it's important to ask, why did they work on those babies? Why were those the babies that they were addressing first? And I think it's really simple. When you realize that the doctor, Dr. Fallot, for tetralogy of Fallot, which is what uh, surgery they worked out, was looking at autopsy. He figured out what he saw based on postmortems. So they were trying to address this, and the reason they were addressing it, because these were not postmortem newborns. These were postmortem toddlers. So if you have a human being running around and you get to know that person and they're dying, you kind of feel like, I want to do something. All right? Whereas in the newborn period, if these babies weren't surviving like many of the later babies, they just never even thought the grass fit their hands around that. But if you have somebody who's squatting and the old netter pictures and doing all that stuff, they were alive. That's why. They were living people and they needed to find a way to address this. So that's why they approached that first. Uh, quickly, in the 1950s, 1960s, they started working on the older school age, preschool age kind of kids. But think about the size of these kids and technology that was available, VSDs, ASDs. Um, they started doing things like stretching and ballooning uh, valves and openings with their fingers at first. And then with little cones, it's kind of interesting to go into the museums and watch these little cones that look like little metal things that you would give to your kid to play with, but they're really just different sized cones to stretch the valves and eventually starting doing with catheters and in the operating room. Um, primary repair in infancy kind of started when we started our training. I mean, it kind of, you don't realize where you walked in the story, so to speak. But this is where kind of I started. And it's really interesting to realize that this was just when they were doing these more complex operations. And I remember the days where, you know, half or more of the hypoplasts died on the operating table. And everybody would gather around the table and say a prayer and say, let's hope the next one works better. Okay, so it's been a pretty quick, uh, if you think about it, evolution since then. But that's what we were doing with Dr. Mustard and Senning dealing with transposition, they did not know how to switch the vessels to single chambers. These were all starting around uh, the 1980s. That's also when sonography started coming into play, so you could actually see this non-invasively, because otherwise, all these kids were getting catheterizations. I can imagine what a catheter looked like in the 1970s. Primary repair in neonates really did not uh, get started till the 1980s out of uh, CHOP. Um, and Boston Children's. I've actually worked with both of these physicians, Dr. Castaneda. I met him in Guatemala when we were doing some work, and he was retired, and he since took over after leaving Boston and has now taken over the Central American program based out of Guatemala for pediatric cardiothoracic surgery. So it's pretty amazing to see that history. Um, Dr. Natus, who is the teacher of my, of my uh, chairman at Columbia, um, just passed away uh, a handful of years ago. Uh, pretty much was at Boston Children's. He would walk around the wards, um, listening to babies, writing on duplicate. Remember what duplicate papers looked like? They had three sheets. He would write down what he heard, and on the postmortem or later on, they would open and find out what they had. Helen von Prague and her husband were at Boston Children's, and she was down in the basement, and she was taking all the cadavers and organizing all their hearts in these, these uh, little displays that now people from all the world come to see. And that was the beginning of the embryology and the understanding of this before we had echo. Um, he became basically the founder of the field from the medical side from the modern era, but probably should have belonged to the Holocaust in some way um, at Johns Hopkins. Later on, we start doing what I just used last night, uh, prostaglandin, 1973, chipped the baby down with uh, truncus. Um, down on this, right in the community setting. Um, it's revolutionizing. Echo again, M mode, not the way, you know, the way we kind of see a picture started in the 70s, but I would say it really started looking like an echo that we know in the 80s. Um, the ability to actually do an operation and keep the baby on bypass for a while in hypothermia in the 1970s. Here is the echo that we know. Uh, my colleague who just passed away within the past five years, uh, Dr. Kleiman, started looking at babies before they're born. He, and Lindsay Allen, who I trained under both of them, were obstetricians who also were pediatric cardiologists. And they started combining the field of OP and cardiology. And pretty amazing. Again, no clue what I was exposed to until years later when you start to appreciate this historically. Um, so pretty amazing. And I'll show you some pictures of that. We do most of our 
evaluation today of a baby with a complex uh, heart problem is prenatal. And you've really got this whole now OB perinatal cardiology kind of thing going on now. Um, the ability to actually intervene um, when you needed to get more oxygen in the blue baby in the 1960s, Dr. Rashkin uh, putting a balloon through the atrial septum and basically ripping it. And that's where I kind of came in in the, in the 80s into Columbia, and that's the first thing you learned how to do. And eventually, was to rip a hole in, a, in the atrium to try to keep transposition. Um, and then you come back and do the operation another day. Subsequently, we just go through the operation. Um, balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty, I'll show you some of that. Again, it used to be the finger, then it was cones, and then eventually balloons without surgery. And the idea of doing um, arrhythmias and addressing that really started with adults um, in the 80s, um, but a lot of this work has expanded, and we have two pediatric electrophysiologists, one from Harvard, uh, and one from Columbia, who now I work with, to come to the office up in this area uh, and do this. And they're right out of this generation, are this uh, legacy of physicians who started electrophysiology. Um, pretty much where we are, where we're going in the field is um, that the surgery, they're tweaking it every day, but I think the main thing that's happening is they're combining surgery and catheterization together. Even um, on Monday, we had a case where the, the, the same position out of the Boston uh, group, originally Harvard, that's working with us now, um, and the surgeon from France, so you can see what's happening, um, basically said, look, you will make me an opening right here, and I'll switch the balloon in there, and you can blow it up in the operating room. So that's what you're starting to see, is that they're combining these things, the cameras and the screens and everything. So you open up the screen, and you've got, um, I have a picture way down, about slide 300, we're not going to get there today, but of you know, a screen that you have the echo, you have the rhythm, you have catheterization, you have the angiogram, you have the vitals, and they're watching all this simultaneously. So really technology has allowed things to be done fairly quickly in response and see things live. Um, no place better control than a cath lab like that. Um, improved non-invasive imaging, the echo, as everything is getting higher depth, and we're getting a lot more physics and physiology, understanding that, and the echo is helping us do that. The original people who did the prenatal work and understood how babies' hearts work prenatally in utero, um, Dr. Rudolph out of San Francisco, and just as he was about to retire as the chair at San Francisco for the pediatric department, fetal echocardiography came on board. He came out of retirement to go back and use fetal and did all of his numbers and all of his work on human beings now. Can you imagine being in your 80s, ready to retire and, and getting excited again? I mean, he's pretty much the founder of our understanding of what prenatal circulation is, and he just like a kid again. He's riding like crazy, putting all this together because technology is allowing him to do it. Thank goodness he's still around to do that. Um, therapy for uh, congestive heart failure. Adults and we have worked on a lot of different understandings of that. Heart transplant, nitric oxide, the primary hypertension. It's supposed to be one in a million, but I've got nine kids with primary pulmonary hypertension in my practice. So the treatment of pulmonary hypertension has been a big issue. Genetic screening, almost every patient, I don't know about you all, but every patient there's a question of, is there a genetic way to do this? Uh, evaluate what this is, risk stratify, check the family, prevent it happening again in other family members. There will be, there is as of now, over one million people who were born with congenital heart defect who are 19 or older. We need 700 adult congenital in the country to address that, and we have 200. Last year, they finally created a board and a training qualifications for the field of adult congenital cardiology. Last year. One. Okay. So uh, Dr. Sue, who you know, and other people like that, are on those boards. They were, it was like, you know, being at NATO. They were finding back and forth. Just up, adult right? cardiologists, yes, training cardiologists who gets adult training. And eventually, they said, it doesn't matter as long as they eventually end up the same creature and they have to take this exam, but we won't have enough. So people who have been caring for these people all along, me, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, have the oldest pet in the United States as my patient. He just passed as a crossing guard down the road. You know, they said they would grandfather us into the field. If we pass an exam, so we have to step out of our practice, pass another exam. And then we'll do that. So, giving you a flavor of where pediatric cardiology is, hopefully. Um, 
multiple disciplinary approaches, applying with the OBs, the obstetricians, the electrophysiologists, the geneticists. It's really a collaboration. And then coming out into the community setting, which is a lot of where this started, coming back into, out in the community because now the technology allows you to do that um, and work in both the combination of networking, community, and uh, tertiary centers. Um, kind of a look of what's happened. This is the office. This is, I mean, a few years ago, this would have been only at the medical center. But this is our office. So we're doing bicycle training and treadmill training with oxygen consumption. A lot of West Pointers get on here, so we'll have to go back down to um, Bethesda, which is where they do a lot of these testing. Um, so we can truly do oxygen consumption and evaluate whether a person might need surgery. So stress test becomes a very important tool uh, for not only the athlete, but for somebody who's had a heart defect to understand, is it time for the next operation? Do we need something? So using uh, functional parameters such as stress testing. Um, this is our reading room. It looks just like the reading room at the medical centers where we can uh, read the echoes live from outside the hospital, uh, the office, in the office, and from stuff that's coming in. And this is our prenatal uh, echo and echocardiography areas. Um, we do the prenatal work in the office very much like a kind of spa thing and uh, try to make an environment nice for the mother. Um, and fetal echocardiography um, has bloomed since Dr. Allen and Dr. Feynman started this. And, and here are some of the reasons um, that it's very, I always find it funny, somebody starts the field and then the insurance company tells you what, when it's valid to do it. Um, but this is the reasons that are, quote, valid to get a, uh, or the indications for a uh, fetal echocardiogram, and what I've highlighted is that IVF, which is a new, uh, relatively blooming technology in the community settings, is a reason to have a prenatal uh, fetal echocardiogram uh, because there is an increased incidence of general heart defects in IVF uh, fetuses, and they've added uh, advanced maternal age, not just advanced maternal age. And then there's a whole bunch of other things, including the typical medication exposures, uh, positions, and pretty much the most common reason is they see something that doesn't look normal. And though I tease my OB colleagues on the field echoes, I think it's very important for all of us to realize, um, and I, I tell the parents this too, I said we don't want to give our you know, business away, so to speak, cat away, but we need to tell the OB something, but we will keep it from them. The heart moves. <laughs> Those pictures that they take are still images still. So when we do, a, they're doing an evaluation of the heart, they're looking at clips, those sonograms. They'll see it move and some of the good uh, MFMs know more about that, but when they eventually are looking and analyze, analyzing a picture, it is a still image. Whereas we're truly doing a moving videotaped image, so to speak, just like you would do an echo afterwards. So a fetal echo in a pediatric cardiologist's hand is like an echo. Okay, it's not in sonogram. Okay, any questions or comments on that? I'm just gonna go over some kind of cases and uh, kind of evaluation. <coughs> any questions on kind of the background? I just wanted to give you a very quick sense of where the field came from and where we are at this point. Yeah. So on that note, I thought we'd do a few case scenarios. Um, basically, then discuss how you evaluate an infant versus a toddler, um, and then maybe an older child. Quickly clarify the, what the different types of heart conditions are, uh, the significance of the age, uh, and then again, back to the basics, the history, what's important, and then uh, just one more case. Um, case one, a full-term uh, baby uh, emergency section because the baby had a fetal bradycardia in utero. Arrhythmias in utero, fast or slow, are, are markers definitely uh, if there's not just some sense of some um, obstetric issue and they're not concerned about the cord or other issues um, is definitely many ways that these babies present. Um, the APGARs were so-so, six and nine. Saturations were mildly depressed on room air. Again, lower extremity. Always do low extremity if you're not sure which one to do, always do the foot. Uh, if you can do hand and foot, great, but if not, do the foot. Uh, they hear a murmur in the newborn uh, period just before they send the baby home. We love that, right, because they're trying to kick the baby out the door, but often these things present in that first 72 hours. Um, mom had a sternotomy scar herself, um, but she doesn't remember why. Not surprising. 
the biggest thing we found, and my senior colleagues have apologized profusely for the following scenario. Mom, dad, 1960s, 70s, your child is fixed, don't worry, everything's fine. That's not true, and we now know a lot of the adult congenitals have no clue what they had and are dealing with medical issues and cardiac issues now, and we're trying to retrain them the way we would now and make them aware of their own body. So this is not surprising. This mom has a scar, she doesn't know why, okay? However, the OB said, look, I think that we need to evaluate this mom before, this baby before birth, because obviously there might have been a congenital heart defect and that could be genetic. So here's the fetal, and what you'll see is the wall of the heart in here, right down there, and the, and the valves, the right side and left side of valves, precuspid and mitral, and if you lean up on the picture a little bit, you will see right over the middle of the wall here, watch right here, there's another valve on top of that. There should be no valve right over the middle of the heart, unless there's some birth defect. And if we really slow it down, we'll see there's actually a hole there and a valve over, and the most common thing the reason that the valve, and this is the order, is over the middle of the wall is tetralogy. It ends up that mom and baby both had tetralogy of flow. Um, the other thing that could do that is called truncus, where that's the only valve, okay? So that was how that's picked up. Not, oh my gosh, the baby's sick or something, but everybody kind of putting it all together. I think that's very important that this is a perinatal kind of approach to this. Case two. Nine month old previously well presented to the physician uh, with bronchiolitis uh, after typical um, you know, respiratory uh, childhood uh, presentation this time of year, um, was being treated for conjunctivitis, noted to be tachycardic after given albuterol, no surprise. So nobody really pays a bunch of attention, but then they say, wow, the heart rate is still up. The breathing is fast. Okay, is this just not being treated? Is this RSV? Um, blood pressures are okay, but the baby doesn't look well when you examine her. There is something wrong with the circulation. Maybe it's cool. There's edema, which is extremely unusual in the child. That usually is a late finding, and the pulses aren't that strong. Okay, this doesn't sound just like RSV anymore. Chest is clear, but this child is irritable, and when you examine the heart, um, there's a normal exam, except there's a soft murmur, and the apex seems a little bit further over to the left, like the heart might be a little big. So they get the EKG, and the first thing you notice is you don't know if that's the P wave or the T wave, they don't have both, and it seems pretty fast. Um, I think this plays. There you go. So that's the heart here and look how fast it's going, and this is SVT, and this was about 250, and I think what's important to realize is that the heart kind of doesn't even look like it's squeezing. So and new, this baby has had this for a while, and when I mean a while, probably weeks. So what was going on and evaluated as respiratory infection and medication, all those kind of things, we're brewing underneath this, and we, the way we know that is because the heart does not get enlarged and stretch like that and squeeze like that when it first starts. It takes weeks to get like that. And in fact, when you look at it, this is the mitral valve, and that blue streak is the valve leaking, not because there's a problem with the mitral valve, but because the heart's not squeezing, so it's all stretched. So they convert it, put the kid on medication, the EKG's got P waves now on it, and squeezing again and eventually that disappeared, all right? So interesting presentation, but that's, this is the time of year. Now you'll see that, and this was, looked like bronchiolitis. Difference was the exam. Um, so how do we approach that? Well, again, the most common things that we're gonna see are a murmur, the color, and respiratory every single time. Diagnosis is difficult because if a child is anemic, and you can do that old calculation. Again, the baby may not look cyanotic if they're relatively anemic, and if they're not well or they're at that nadir, they may actually not look that blue. And I find they, more, they look more pasty than anything when they get like that. So look, listen to the exam. Is there a murmur or not? What's their color, saturation if you have that, and um, how are they breathing? 
the murmurs, um, pretty much the way I, I've always evaluated a murmur is that the breathing, when quiet, is two. Then you just go to each side of two in terms of what you call the number. So if it's quieter than two and the breath kind of makes that murmur not easy to hear when the baby's breathing, then it's probably a one. If they're about the same, it's two. Louder than that, it's three. It's extremely unusual to have a four and a five. A five murmur can be heard just like that fan on that right now. That's what a five murmur is. So you're walking in a room going, how come I'm hearing and I don't even have a stethoscope on. That's a five. Okay, so Thank think you. about that. That's very, very unusual. So that's kind of the characterization of the murmurs. And of course, we, I always tell the family, a murmur is not always the same place. The difference between somebody listening to and listening for is the key. Listening to something, you might as well be at a concert and listening and saying, it sounds a little off, but I don't know why. Listening for means you're walking down and you're listening up at the valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves. You're listening to mitral valves. You're listening alongside. You're listening for certain things. It's what I would say the head, mind is on before the step goes down. And that's what the New York Times was talking about a little bit. Okay, cyanosis um, is seen in patients with cyanotic heart lesions or those who have low output or who have just generally decreased oxygenization. Um, again, this was the, is the calculation that it's caused by increased deoxyhemoglobin. It has to be greater than 5 gram percent, reducing oxygen availability delivered to the tissues. Many normal infants uh, get the modeling. That's what the parents are always calling us about, right? You know, the feet, the hands, the mouth, they're outside, they're in the bathtub. And uh, this is pretty much um, when it's marbled is the cutest mama Mars and the, uh, sorry, mama rata and the um, kind of the peripheral uh, uh, acrocyanosis is very common. What I found out when it came to this area was that there are wells in this area that actually have a lot of nitrates. And it was our hematology colleagues who told me about that. And some of the babies actually who are in well water will have more uh, cyanosis uh, because of nitrate levels. We switch them to bottled water and it disappears. Their oxygen saturations are right, but the coloration is there. And all these wells, we tested them for the first five years, meet standards, but some children are extremely sensitive to those levels. So change in bottled water, and it takes a month or two because those cells have to die, those red cells have to turn over, and it disappears. Okay. Uh, when respiratory distress occurs in a newborn, it, um, do not assume that it's primarily respiratory. Keep in the back of your mind, could this be otherwise? I think everybody does that very well. Um, is primary cardiac, uh, if it's a cardiac etiology, um, it's what we call the happy tachypnea. They're smiling, otherwise fine, but they're just doing that. Somebody with a primary respiratory problem usually looks pretty labored, doesn't look quite happy. Um, oops. And then, of course, the story, the history uh, of the um, failure to thrive, the uh, diaphoresis, falling asleep easily, not uh, being awake for a long time, it's prolonged time uh, between feedings. They just kind of, the parents are struggling to try to get that feeding. And, uh, and then often they will either, if they're an older child, complain that they're full easily, um, or they will basically um, constantly wake up being hungry. Um, or actually vomit if they're in heart failure. So feeding issues, we always get that. I had a baby saw two days ago referred for cardiology because of feeding issues. But when the feeding issue was there, they built a lot of phlegm, was building a lot of upper respiratory stuff, spit it up, but then we keep going. That's not a cardiac feeding issue, all right? The cardiac feeding issue is the baby looks like they're trying to run a marathon and have a meal at the same time. They just can't do it. They can't keep up with both. There's too much energy for them. So peripheral edema is a very late finding. By the time you see that, that child is not well. So that's why that other child had to be in that tachycardia for some time. Um, it's different in adults, and um, pre-tibial and pre-sacral edema are late developments. It's very important to realize that those are late. That means you're in trouble already. That child is already up on the acuity level. Um, and that's pretty much because they're lymphatics and the way they process tissue. Kids are very efficient that way. They really have to be quite sick before the tissue uh, fluid builds up in the tissues. Um, when it does develop, it's first in the eyes, um, and then it usually has other signs first. Uh, the breathing, the heart rate's up, the breathing, and the hepatomegaly. So it's a late, late finding. That's the point. Edema is a late finding. You're already behind the eight ball by that time shows. Angina is very, very rare. It can occur in a kid who's known to have 
uh, an aortic valve problem that's severe, but those kids are usually already evaluated, seeing there's a huge murmur there. But so many kids complaining that kind of atypical pain, very unusual child, but the one entity that does that is an anomalous coronary artery. The ones who have toddler abnormal coronary arteries present in failure, and they're not telling you it hurts because they don't speak yet. But there are the young athletes, and we talked a little bit about that, who may say that they get atypical chest pain, when they're, particularly when they're exercising. Um, and then it may again show up as a tachycardia, which is always fun to be evaluating on an echo kid in tachycardia and trying to find the coronaries at the same time when the heart rate's 280, but sometimes we have to do it. Squatting, that's the typical um, netter view of the tach patient. Uh, and the reason they do that, again, is if the blood is going into the body versus the lungs, if you squat, it has a hard time. Uh, the resistance goes up just because you're bending down. So the resistance in the, the largest vessels is increased, pushing the blood back up towards the pulmonary circuit instead of to the body. That's why the kids and toddlers figured out this worked. It also works for fainters for the same reason. So if their pressure is dropping and they squat, and goes up, they feel better, much better than just lifting the legs. And then the hypoxic spells, the, the hardest thing is this time of year is they usually have three or four toddlers, or not toddlers, three or four month olds, and trying to get the parents to the surgery, which is usually done in three to six months now, sometimes nine months, because they're watching like a hawk and they're at home. And will I miss it? Will I know if the kid spells? They have this it's a very frightening thing. They remember it for the rest of their lives. But we talk about, um, you know, that with the parents, and we're spending a lot of time with them, how to recognize a spell at home in their baby who we know already has tetralogy, okay? Um, of course, then, uh, the exam is important. Any other features of any other system, that may be abnormal of a birth defect, especially central line defects like cleft palates and stuff, heart has to be part of the mixture, 20 to 30, sometimes 50% of the time there is a heart lesion along with that as well. Um, looking at the tone for metabolic disorders, uh, such as the mitochondrial disorders and things, really think about can the heart be involved. So we get a lot of patients like, why are they thinking of the heart? The nurses will say, why are they bringing this kid to the heart? And say, well, he's hypotonic. He says, well, what does that have to do with anything? Always keeping the fact that the heart is involved in a lot of those different kinds of things. Um, and then basically, um, when we evaluate the pulses, I think the pulses are important. They should be fairly easy even and easy to find in a calm toddler. How often does that happen? But one of the things that's striking is you really shouldn't be able to feel the pulse behind the knee so well. well the pulse, if it's real, wow, you touch it, it bangs out. There probably is a PDA there. And if the kid's color isn't that great, the question is why? Why is there still a PDA there? Not a kid who's happy and growing and thriving, but you know, you still feel that. So one of the classic pulses, you feel they can really look real smart, is just feel behind the knee. And if that pulse is really strong, then you might have still a duct open. And the question is, is this child dealing with a lesion that needs the duct, so to speak? So in the nursery, we get, you know, babies with tests and things like that. When's the best time to do a ultrasound of the heart? Do you do it while they're in the hospital, or would you do it sort of a week later? Uh, you mean an echocardiogram? Yeah, if you're worried about a 20% chance of them having a congenital heart lesion. So you have a kid you don't have a class. Oh, who's otherwise well, otherwise but has well. other features. Yeah, I would do that before they leave the hospital. Um, and the classic one is the kid you think might be down, so you're not sure half the time. Um, because some of those would present with clinical episodes if they're ductal dependent, either for the blood flow to the body or to the lungs. And here you had a kid with a captive audience at that point. And uh, I've always erred on the side of getting this position before the child leaves. But if you do it on day one, I mean, that's just close, are you still able to pick up? Sure, yeah. absolutely. We may not be able to tell what the ultimate outcome will be if the duct is still there, that is correct. But we will know whether there's an issue <coughs> by then. Yeah, we will know whether or not there's something to watch or this looks absolutely fine. Okay. Yes, so the echo will help you that early. Cardiac inspection, of course, the breathing, um, the uh, where the apex is, very important. Even on a baby, it should be below the nipple on the fourth intercostal space. It seems to be the heart's really pounding off of the left side. Or many of what you all pick up, I admit it's not the cardiologist, the nurse usually in the NICU, I can't hear the heart here, it's over on the right. Very, very common. The nurses are really the ones who are picking a lot of that stuff up. Um, and the right ventricle, it's very important to realize, and my image is this, the, it's not right-left, 
but the right chamber is in the front. It's front back. Even in complex heart disease, the one true thing that always holds is the right ventricle is in the front. It's usually on top a little bit, but it's in the front. So if you feel this heart really kicking, you hear a murmur, and the heart's really kicking, pulmonary stenosis. They said, it's the most common thing you would think. So because the right chamber is in the front, so if that baby's heart's really kicking, that's the right ventricle. Okay, important to think that. Thrill means there's a lot of blood running somewhere. So the most classic place to feel for a thrill is not your fingertips. Where do you want a paper cut? And your fingers are in between your fingers. You don't want it between your fingers, and the reason is because that's a really sensitive area. Go like that, and you'll feel it on like a web. You'll feel the thrill right up between your nice and gently. So if you feel the thrill, that's not normal. And um, again, where the apex is. Um, and then we talked about this gets cut off, got cut off, but location and timing of the murmur. When the heart's pretty fast, it's kind of hard to pick up, but again, is it above, middle, or down? That's pretty much what I would say in terms of the murmur. Um, kind of helps you isolate where this might be coming from. Uh, it's also important in a newborn period, when you hear the murmur and it's loud and you think it's in the middle, that probably could be a good sign because the small VSDs make the loudest noise. Really the problem is the big VSDs that don't make much of a noise, and they're the ones who are going home and show up a week or two later in heart failure. They're showing up in your clinic, not gaining weight and doing stuff. So just because there's a loud murmur, you won't have to alarm the pan. That could be a good thing. It could mean that that VSD is quite small, especially if you're hearing it in the middle. If it's a loud murmur and it's up top, that's different. But in the middle, it's probably a good sign. The smaller the opening, the tighter it is, the louder the murmur will probably be at that point. We classify the heart um, defects into an obstructive, shunts, and blue. Um, basically, blockages are simple. The blood can't get out to the uh, heart or the lungs, so aortic stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, and pulmonary stenosis. It's important to realize that these things can be ductal dependent. People don't think of it going as the blue things. But the duct not only, in utero, the duct feeds the lower body, and afterwards it feeds the lungs. But if the body is telling the heart and the circulation, look, I need more blood there because it's not getting enough, enough out, the duct may also be what feeds, even after birth, the body, not just the lungs. So a ductal dependent lesion is not just a blue heart lesion. It could be something like aortic stenosis or coarctation, which is where the blood's not getting enough for the body itself. Left to right shunts, BSDs, ASDs, and ducts. The truth is most of those we just watch. They, and there's a question I had to fill out on the uh, questionnaires, when do those present? Those usually don't cause symptoms until two to three months of age. They might know why it doesn't cause symptoms until two to three months of age? Increased rate of pressure. What's that? The increased rate of pressure from birth. At birth. Yeah. So pressure, and this is where people will get very, remember in fellowship, every game pick it. Is it pressure or is it resistance? It's resistance. So the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart are the same in utero in terms of their pressure, their size, their oxygen levels, in many ways, subtle differences, to be worked out by Dr. Rudolph still, prenatally. But the lungs, as they expand and open up, start to relax. That first magical breath drops the resistance in the lungs as those uh, vessels open up to half of the, where they are, so they're still elevated, give you a sense the right heart pressure because of that is usually still 30 to 40. And then by two to three months, it finally drops down to 20s and 30s where it should be. That's when you're gonna see the biggest difference between the right and the left and the biggest shunt, and that's where the murmur's gonna be loudest, and if they're gonna be symptomatic, that's when they're gonna be. And that's a good thing. We want that process to happen because if it doesn't happen, you're worried for some reason that the pressures or the resistances have stayed high. And why is that? And that's a false security because that kid could be had developing pulmonary vascular disease, just like the four-year-old who walked into the office last week and couldn't walk from you to me with an ASD. And everybody thought we were going to close that ASD. We would kill the kid on the spot, and that's what they wanted to do elsewhere. Pulmonary vascular disease. That shouldn't be there at four years old in an ASD. So be careful. The murmur is not, if you don't hear the murmur by two to three months and you know you have an opening, that's a problem too. 
because that's when it should be its loudest, and that's when the child should start showing some symptoms, okay? Cyanotic heart lesions, um, I used to call it the four T's, tetralogy, transposition, total anomalous point of interest return, and tricuspid atresia. And there's a combination of that and the access to EKGs and all these kind of neat tricks that can look really smart, but basically, as soon as the child's oxygen levels are blue, we do a 100% hyperoxia test, we're thinking, are, is it one of the four T's? And this is going to be the most common, is tetralogy. Uh, four limb blood pressures, the rule of Now we started doing the oxygen uh, levels and the car seat tests and everything before they leave. And I will tell you that those tests are picking up more coarctation than the four limb blood pressures are. They're actually working. They were created in New Jersey, that, that oxygen test before the baby leaves, that's now mandated because a congressman lost his grandson to that, mandated this, asked people to look into this, and this little thing that they do before the baby leaves the oxygen test, the one thing that sneaks by the most is coarctation. And the reason is that when you try to get the nurses to do a four limb blood pressure before the baby goes, they got their paperwork to do, that was even a few years ago, now it's even worse. They don't have the time, the blood pressure to scream, they're using the automated machine, they're not after it, it's not working. And then when they call the pediatrician and he says, look, I, I've tried it twice, it's not working, can you come in? I've got an awful cup, just, and that's what's happening. So the oxygen test is actually picking up the differential oxygen saturation between the upper and lower, and we're picking up cohort. That's the one we're picking up in a few AV canals, which is important because last year in our region in NIAC, two babies came in and out and up from cohort. Okay, so that's just the one I know about that could have been picked up before, because when that presents, that's a lethal illness, and that shouldn't exist in 2015 anymore. So that's why these things are being done. Uh, so remember, in Coark, the upper and lower extremities are different oxygen saturations because the duct is continuing to do what it did before birth, which is supply the lower body, and the upper body is there. So the difference in oxygen levels, the lower body will be uh, bluer, and if it's reversed and the upper body is bluer, you look brilliant, that's transposition. And that's, so the SATs can be very helpful. So every time we get an echo, I think you know, two days of age. An echo? An echocardiogram. At two days? Let's say someone gets an echo. Okay. And it says something like, uh, cannot rule out cola. Mm -hmm. The doctor is still open. So the question is, why can't you rule it out in the echo? However, the, the O2 SAT is a, is a good test. What they're saying is they're being a radiologist. The person reading the echo is being a radiologist and saying, I have no idea who this kid is. You do. Clinical correlation advised. That's this stuff. They're saying the echo is not the test, that the bedside is. And to this day, the blood pressures are still really the test. So what they're saying is if you have a clinical suspicion, that's what they really should be saying, if you have a kind of suspicion this might be a core, by any other means, don't hang your hat on the echo. That's what that means. It doesn't say that, though, does it? And, and I think that's why you should never separate, I'm just a purist in that, the echo should never be separated from the cardiology consultation. I don't think you should be getting it. If you're thinking an echo, you should have a cardiologist at the bedside. If you're thinking seizure, you just do an EEG and never call a neurologist, but somehow the echo has been this magic bullet. And what they're trying to do is say, because that's out there, we're going to put our, cover our tails and put that little line on there for you. That's covering their tails and still leaving you to figure out the rest. So don't hang your hat on the echo in that situation. Make sense? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, always get the EKG before current cardiology is simple, but it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, we grill our residents and our fellows when they don't, so we kind of say, please give me an EKG because it is so helpful. If there's a left axis and they're fully saturated, it might be canal, even if they don't look like downs. If they're blue and it's left axis, there is nothing else but tricuspid valve atresia on that combination. And, and that's true since the 1950s this has worked. Or a canal, uh, inlet VSD is basically canal. Precordial forces, uh, if there's a lot of right heart forces on the EKG, it might be a hypoplast or transposition because in that situation, the right heart continues to be the main, a main chamber pumping to the body in transposition, whereas in the hypoplast, there is no left heart. So the EKG can be very helpful. And of course, your, uh, an arrhythmia, or, or if it's really complicated, we might be dealing with more complex. So the EKG can actually open up the whole can of worms for us. I'd rather have an EKG than an echo, by far. 
all right? And significance of the age of polyethylene heart failure in the first three days of life is usually due to a stenosis or a coart. There's not enough blood getting out to the body. But the reason for that is that a shunt takes two or three months. There's resistance issues. So if a baby's already presenting like they're not getting enough blood, it's not a shunt. Okay? It's that they're not getting enough blood, and that's a blockage or an obstruction. Central cyanosis uh, is pre present at birth, birth as the duct closes, and uh, usually by five days of age when they're home. So that's the problem with that idea. In tetralogy, it may develop quite a bit later. Okay? We do have babies who now we're able to operate on. I have several of them who were two or three days old with tetralogy because they really were blue right away, and they were so blue we could not send them home. But many of them we send home at 70, 80 some percent, 90 percent, and we watch them to see if they're spelling. And there's a lot of close monitoring. You can only do that with the combination of the pediatrician and you in the community. You can't do that if the cardiologist isn't in the community. You really can't because it's really close monitoring back and forth at home. Um, heart failure that develops later is the left to right shunt for the reasons we talked about. If the, this is the pulmonary vascular disease issue, if it's high, um, then even though there's communication, you may not get the shunt and get worried that it might be pulmonary hypertension. Premature infants, another question, wasn't on the list there. High or low resistance of premature infant in the lungs? You think of them as having lung disease, right? EPD and stuff. But is the resistance in a baby who's 30 weeks or younger in the lungs high or low? Hi. Okay. Anybody with low? Anybody? Not sure? Okay. It's low. The resistance does not develop until 30 plus weeks. That's when the muscle tone in the little vessels develops. That's why preemies go into failure with a PDA. Right away. Think about that combination. Otherwise, why would a PDA be dangerous in a preemie and not a full term baby? And it's because their resistances are so low that the shunt happens right away in a premature infant and they just can't get off the vent, they can't grow, they can't do it. They're already in failure at birth. That's important. A preemie has low resistance in their lungs. Even, imagine that combination if they have BPD. Imagine that combination. Can't breathe well and have low resistance and have the duct. You wonder why these babies are in trouble. Uh, pulmonary resistance usually drops by, huh, there, there was the answer, six to eight weeks, allowing the left right shunt. When an infant presents eight weeks with respiratory stress, it may not just be a pneumonia. If heart failure develops after three months, look for myocarditis. This is the season, cardiomyopathy, uh, attack cardio like you saw. And this is the one I want everyone to remember, EKG, EKG, EKG on all of these. Alcapa is a classic presentation. It's an abnormal coronary artery that's not arising from the aorta. It's coming from the coronary artery. And they present just like the BSDs and stuff at that point when the, for the same reason, but it's ischemia, not a shunt, at two to three months. Okay. Um, importance of history, we kind of did that. Uh, prenatal history, I'm seeing two moms today who are alcoholics, uh, checking the babies before birth for fetal alcohol syndrome and some of the heart issues. Rubella was the PDA, pulmonary stenosis, seizures um, kind of thing. Um, uh, maternal diabetes, very, very big thing. What's really cool about that is it used to be 50% of the babies were born too big and 50% of them had some type of heart defect. We're now down to 5% because of the good control, insulin pumps, and the fact that the OBs are not saying nothing we could do. They're actually watching very closely the uh, diabetic issues uh, prenatally and exposures to other toxins. Uh, delivery is important, um, an important prequel um, is the persistent pulmonary hypertension which may make the baby blue and make the heart not be able to go through its natural changes. This is where Dr. Gersony, um, my chairman at Columbia, who's actually still the only one alive in the first five, which is interesting. You, we talk about Dr. Natus. He from Boston when I did the history. Eventually his chairman at Boston said, you like this stuff. He goes, yeah, that's kind of interesting. He goes, well, why don't you put those papers together that you're writing down, make a book, and you're now in charge of pediatric cardiology. Well, there's no such thing. No. So that's how he became the head of pediatric cardiology. He trained five people in our, our my chairperson um, at Columbia who's now in semi-retirement. He's the only one still alive. So kind of think about it. And this is what he did. 
His work at Boston before he left was persistent fetal circulation. Why doesn't a baby, like Dr. Rudolph was doing on lambs, why doesn't a baby go and open the lungs and go through the transition? What stops them? And why does their circulation continue to be high resistance and act like they're still in utero? And we see the meconium issues here. We see the birth defects, congenital heart defects, and, um, and prematurity um, is important to look at for the ductus so they maintain that prenatal circulation. So the concept that the baby didn't go through the transition, why, is important. And um, it's really interesting. You go all your training, you don't realize that you're doing all this, and the person who started it was right behind you. You know, it's, it's really kind of cool to know that. If one parent has an anomaly family history, the risk goes up quite a bit. It can be as high as 10%. When it's cousins, it's down to 2%. And no family history, um, if the firstborn has congenital heart lesion, the risk of the second is up to 2 to 3%. This is all kind of the risk stratification we do before birth. So that doesn't sound high, but that's higher than the one out of 1,000 which is the general population. So that's kind of how the numbers lay out there. Last case, eight-year-old asymptomatic child presents to the office with a murmur, an eight-year-old. They're growing. They don't really look that bad. Their oxygen levels are well. Their exam is pretty benign. Did the blood pressures. Um, weight and everything are normal percentiles, but the murmur is not just two. It's louder than the breath sounds. So up here, it's a little higher, and you hear this little other sound up there too, which is not just but. And you go, okay, and the ventricles pounding. And you're like, well, I can feel it easy. It must be on the right side. Everything else is normal. Kid looks good. Do the EKG. This is an eight-year-old, and this is where the EKGs come in. You look at one, and ABF, one is still down, ABF is up. That's a newborn in KG. There's usually by four, one is up. So somehow that baby's heart did not go from a right axis at birth to the left axis, so it's got a right axis. Here we are, we need these other leads. This is 4R and 3R. These are more rightward, and here's one. One, three, four R, and four R are all the way on the right, and usually by this age, the QRS doesn't exist anymore. By four, the QRS doesn't all look all up. This is all upwards on the right. Where's the left, which is down? Where is it? So this is right, right, right. Exams, right, right, right. Murmurs, right, right, right. What's the leading? Eight-year-old is otherwise well. Pulmonary well, stenosis, agreed? Right, so here you go. So, let's see. Sometimes they play, sometimes they don't. Okay, so just the first point of um, this is that the heart looks fine, four-chamber heart, the valves are there. This is the tricuspid, the mitral. You don't see many major holes in here with color. We don't either. Um, this is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. And what's interesting, here's the septum in the middle. This, this is usually round on the left ventricle, and this wall is usually round as well. If you use the septum, kind of like a thermostat or a balance. If it's all the way bulging from the left into the right, so it's all of a nice circle, usually the, that means the left ventricle is the highest pressure. If the septum in any way is a little flatter, then maybe the pressure on the other side is a little high too. So the septum becomes your scale. And that's where we can evaluate pressure sometimes. So that already is suspicious that that's not completely round. It's a little bit flat. It's more of a straight then typically it'll be a nice round circle bulging all the way into this side. Here, there's one valve over here that's yoda, but this thing up here that's moving and coming down here, this is the pulmonary valve. And when we look at it, I think I put it this way. No? For some reason on different computers it doesn't play, but when you actually see it playing, that valve, there was a turbulence here. I don't know why it's not. We really wanted to show you that. But there you go. That's what it looks like on Echo. If you had seen that, for some reason, it doesn't want to run them together. Um, that extra color flow that you saw, instead of being nice and blue, was all mixed up there. 
that's the echoes uh, presentation of what we're hearing as the murmur, it's the turbulence. And it started right at that valve, and then we did a measurement of how much so you got a pressure of 80. And so the echo also allows you to do what catheters used to do and measure how blocked up that is. 80 is a moderately severe gradient across the valve. So they went in, catheter, did what they did back in the 1970s, and even before 60s, catheter without operation, this used to be an operation, put a balloon from the right side, just like the patient's facing you, across the valve, stretch it, done forever. This person will never need anything else in their life. So um, that's kind of where we are. I just thought that was the last case, um, and I'm done with that, but I was hoping that would be kind of a feel of what pediatric cardiology is like. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts? That patient with asymptomatic, would he have had some degree of exercise intolerance or anything even? Not at that level. And the reason that this was done was not because it was severe now, but because of where we know in natural history where that will end up. So much of what we do in pediatric cardiology and pediatric medicine in general is preventative. It's an anticipation of knowing where you're going and can we change the natural history of that by intervening now. So a lot of pediatric cardiology is very hard because your parents are saying, but the kid looks fine. Why are you putting my kid through this now? And it's like because they won't be fine later on. And I think it's important to realize that our predecessors didn't know the answers to those questions when they were asked yet they have established that over time for us, made it easy, and they've said, when the parents asked them then, what's gonna to happen to my kid? They said, I don't know, but I will find out. To forget what they found out is just gonna repeat that same cycle there. We do know what happens in a lot of these things and what the natural history is, and I think that's the one thing that Dr. Gersony has done better than all the research and all the training he's done, is he's kept track of all these people in the natural history study for four, now five generations. So that basic question that the parents ask, what's going to happen? I don't know. We will find out. He was true to his word. And that is quoted around the world. What happens if you have pulmonary stenosis? We know at certain levels, by two years old at a certain level, this is what's going to happen. So when this kid comes here, we know this is going to cause trouble later. Let's deal with it now based on what we know is going to happen. Okay. So, so what got stretched there? Or the valve. The valve was stretched, and right. now as this child is only eight, now they're full grown. It continues to grow as they yes. grow. Yes, correct. Yeah, and in fact, I think of the valves when they're stuck like that, like puzzle pieces, that last little piece of the puzzle that just doesn't, isn't been separated by the cutter, so the valve does that for you. It's a very good point. When the valves are very, very young, and the babies are brand new, and they're really blocked up, and they're this 80, 90, 100, at birth, that's called critical. At birth, that's a critical scenario. They're so young, and they got so much growth, if we stretch it then, those valves end up looking more like normal valves later on without the resultant leak that we often get, even though they were the sickest ones at first. This kid is gonna end up with a leak because he doesn't have that much more time to, for the heart to grow, and it's a little later, so he'll end up not with ever a perfect valve. It'll be fine, and he should, the answer is he probably will never need anything else again, but his valve will never be perfect, whereas that real sick baby whose valve is almost completely blocked up and you thought it was blue and all that, well, actually, years later, it not looked like there was anything ever done. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. As general pediatricians, uh, give us like a, a road map from the nursery, toddler, infant stage, older children, adolescents most common people diagnosis that we miss. That may be a, a drastic, uh, you know, like a, they can play in sports and they just drop that. Yeah, it's, it's not gonna be the sports lesions. The sports lesions are really later lesions. Uh, there are the arrhythmias that we think some of those actually present as the alties now, the SIDS, old SIDS. Um, the, the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, um, they're the coronary disease that are not quick. Those are later on with symptoms as an adolescent. So those, you're not on the hook at the newborn period to miss something that dropped the kid in the field. That's not what you're looking for in the newborn period. What's gonna get the baby at home is the coart. The coart is still that bugaboo that's still out there. Uh, Cyanotic heart disease, I think we're better at that because we've mandated, it was a big debate, but because they've mandated those oxygen tests, the CAR-C tests and stuff, 
And I don't think anybody's fighting anymore. I think those things we know don't take that long and they work. So the one that we're left with after all these years trying to find out is the subtle lesion like the canal or the VSD or something, but that won't kill the kid. Okay, that'll present in your office at two to three months. Or, wow, this kid looks more down than I thought they did, on and on, and then I should check, because at first they didn't look so much so. But the one that's going to kill the kid is the cohort. The real blue lesions, like the transpositions and all that stuff, which is what we used to be on the hook for, we're picking up now with these other tests. So I think the blood pressures and that pulse issue is really the key. So that's why that echo doesn't get you off the hook at all. If you're concerned about the blood pressures and pulses don't feel so good and the lower extremity pulses, or SAP, sorry, are a little lower, five points or more lower than the, than the uppers, nobody's going to fault you for being cautious, saying, Mom, that we can't go home yet. In, the, you know, in some of the families, which can be a genetic uh, you know, condition. That's later, except for the SIDS issue. And I think that until we adopt the policies of some of our European colleagues of doing an EKG on everybody, which we don't do, until we do that, we're really going to have to use family history because that's not something we're screening on. It's, we believe that some of the babies who have ALTI or SIDS are the arrhythmias. There is some data that's getting stronger that's supporting that. It was logical, but they didn't have anything to back it up. That's starting to happen, particularly in socialized medicine countries where they can really document this with Brugada, right ventricular dysplasia, prolonged QT. So the history is going to be your key there. And I think if you do a history, is there ever been anything like that in the family, unexplained sun cardiac events or something like that? That would be warrant to EKG in the newborn period. So the EKG, I mean, the history will probably be enough to pick those up, uh, if you're not sure, and deafness. Are there people with bilateral sensory neural deafness? Not one-sided, bilateral sensory neural deafness in the family or somebody who had one of these syndromes, dropped on the field, sun cardiac event, pacemakers. These are the things I also think, as in my other talk I gave, that need to be um, kind of consistent at all the school levels, but they're not. So in the newborn period, when you got your first chance to grab them, the family history will probably be as good as an EKG, and then you'll hone on that kid and get the EKG. Obviously, if the kid had any type of arrhythmia, too slow, too fast, perinatally, EKG as well. I'm struck by the 20% of children with cleft palate have some cardiac issue. Yeah. And I guess I'm wondering, is if you look broadly, that may be true, because it includes a lot of children with some other complex congenital uh, defects. Central defects, correct. Or, or just some genetic issues. Right. You know? But if, you're, if, you're, if you have a newborn with a cleft palate with some of you, that you don't think it's down, okay, you don't think there's anything. So the cardiac exam is normal. Do you do an echo test for that child? No, but I'd probably do an EKG. I would do the EKG and I might just do, you know, the, now you don't have pressure, you're going to get the SAT check. You're going to get it anyway. You're going to get the SAT check and then get the EKG. And if it's not perfect, then I would do the echo. Yeah. But you'd have the, the cardiologist do the child. After, that's in the birth log. It's yeah. as an outpatient if everything else is normal. Is there a predominance of any particular lesion with the kids with cleft? Yeah, just the, the, the more benign stuff, which is good news. Um, the ASDs, VSDs, other central things. If you think about um, the ectopia cordis, which I've only seen a couple times, but it's very impressive where the, the heart, the, the, the stomach, uh, the intestines, and everything, the diaphragmatic hernia, are still outside. You realize why this all happens because the, as the fetus forms and everything incorporates and then gets kind of tucked in properly, if that doesn't happen, you see this is all happening at the same time, and that's where all these midline defects occur. So the good news is that, no, most of those do not have the critical heart lesions. They have the kind of stuff that may close on its own, or we may have to close, but it later on. Well, yes, from just my own personal uh, thing, I just returned from Columbia doing questions. Uh, you probably saw, but we did 67 people. And so probably 40 of those were cleft palates. I did not pick up 20% uh, in my screening of those. 
what would be the indicators that I need, and I'm not going to be able to get EKGs or echoes on any of them uh, when we were in Lima. Or when we were in Peru, you have to send the kid all the way to the capital to get a pediatric uh, EKG uh, or uh, echo. What would be my indicators to not send somebody like that to the OR? Uh, O2 SAT. Yeah, the murmur, the SAT. Um, if you can't get an EKG, then I definitely would want to know that the dynamic percordium is all right because the pulmonary stenosis or the ASDs are going to create a heave. So the exam is not normal. Okay, if I have seen it. The truth is, if the exam seems all right, even if I have a little ASD, a little pulmonary stenosis, a little baby's going to be fine with the operation. It's not going to hurt them. It's going to be an issue for another day, but it won't hurt you during the perioperative period. And there are many lesions that we did when we went to Guatemala, where Dr. Castaneda was, and I've gone to Nicaragua and other places and been in the same scenarios. We'll know that there's a lesion there. We're not 100% sure, and we have to weigh the risk-benefit, whether that will be dangerous for the kid or not. Every single one of those lesions that's dangerous, the exam is not normal. It really isn't. I think that's what you have to hang on. It's ideal if you can get an EKG machine, though. I mean, most of these uh, charity groups will. I've got three in the office that are dust. I mean, I'll give you one. I mean, these work well. Huh? <laughs> As the kids say, internet. Right? <laughs> yeah. I have facts right on this thing now. Right. Okay, so. All right. Any yeah, other questions? Basic times an echo. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were doing on a kid that probably was a test, and we FaceTimed it back to the States. Um, yeah. Got a hold of the echo machine and did that. Couldn't Charlie Cle Kleinman, who I mentioned there, was the founder of pediatric fetal work at OB. Funniest man. Actually had cancer, lymphoma, treated, came out of Yale, came to Columbia, went to heart failure because of the complications of that, eventually died from it about five years ago. One of the biggest memorials I've ever seen in Cornell. The whole East side was packed, people. And when the IT people were in at Columbia trying to work on transtelephonic echo for the doctors in the offices and other places and like that, and they were giving them a hard time. Funniest man, I can't say exactly what he said. Um, really dirty mouth, but great. But he basically turned around and he said, what? He goes, here. And he put his little Apple camera on and he goes, how's that work? <laughs> Ten bucks. How much are you charging us? Oh, it was horrible. But we've been doing that kind of thing for years and years, and that was his point. You know, if you can do this as easily as we already can do it, fine. But otherwise, get out of my hair and get out of here. You're bothering me is what he told them. Um, we can definitely have technology to put a camera on, on the screen and get enough information to make a decision, absolutely. So I love it when we get CT scans, bone scans, all that stuff for osteomyelitis, and somebody goes, legs hot. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right, thank you very much. All right, pleasure, guys. Now, Have good holidays. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, we passed around formal agendas. We really moved up to yeah, a new level of formality. But uh, there's really only a couple of things that we want to do. Most of it is the CI, and I really want to concentrate on that. But I want to go through a couple of the things real quickly that that, that will be quick. Uh, first, Sandy, you can We are very full, extraordinary full. Uh, we are basically putting <laughs> patients down all day long because our unit is not amenable to judge each kid in the room by themselves. So please be very patient with us if we're on the phone with you and say, ah, because, you know, I'm looking at the board. I don't know where to put this kid. Um, so just be patient with us, and we may have to route some kids through the ED and cannot take them on directly because there's just no place to put them. Um, that's where we are. We are seeing hair flus. Um, we are seeing a lot of rhino um, as well. And so that's, that's what we're picking up when we set them. So I usually like to say that when I pick up one of them, there's probably like 50 of them in your office. <laughs> so those kids that are caught in like I had a pertussis. We have heard that baby went down to Westchester and stayed there for 45 years. And where? And where? 
Okay. Yeah, we have an answer. We're about time. I mean, usually it's three for every three or four years, and it's been about that long since we talked. So we should be seeing it. So should we be more routinely checking it? I don't know. You know, I always figure we diagnose one out of twenty. I don't know how to explain it. They're not. We have a certain threshold.